Next up, I am very excited to have first time speaker Tammy Stellanova come up and tell us about a truly exceptional tortoise, Lonesome George, the last of his kind. Hi, my name is Tammy Stellanova, and in 1998, I was lucky enough to visit the Galapagos Islands and see Lonesome George in person, the last living Pinta Island Galapagos tortoise. Lonesome George. Okay. Can I? Uh. George was known as an endling, the last living specimen of his subspecies before he died in 2012. Uh, just a little bit of background about the Galapagos Islands. Um, they're a volcanic archipelago that formed over a hot spot between five to 10 million years ago, about 500 miles west of South America in the Pacific Ocean. They're now part of Ecuador and the 18 or so islands span both above and below the equator. Um, you can see at the top there, the tiny island of Pinta where George was from. The Galapagos Islands are a barren volcanic landscape, a hard place to live for the animals that made it there. It has little fresh water, um, really limited vegetation and resources, and it's surrounded by hundreds of miles of open ocean. So every creature that did end up there and survived ended up evolving special characteristics due to these unique pressures. Here's some examples of the weird stuff you can find in the Galapagos Islands. Um, the Galapagos marine iguana is the world's only ocean-going lizard that feeds exclusively on marine algae. Uh, the flightless cormorant is like other cormorants in that it's a diving bird, but it has no natural predators and doesn't need wings anymore, so its wings have sort of evolved into stumps. Um, the <laughs> they don't need them. The, the vampire finch is a bird that feeds in some normal ways, but also supplements its diet by pecking other birds and drinking their blood. Um, and then there's the Galapagos giant tortoise, which is somewhat of a living fossil because we used to have giant tortoises on all the continents, but they're now only left in two island chains in the, in the whole world. You may have heard of the Galapagos Islands because of Charles Darwin, the English naturalist, biologist, and scientist who lived um, from 1809 to 1882 and was so inspired by the ecological uniqueness of the Galapagos Islands that he came up with his theory of evolution by natural selection. Um, most of you probably know he was struck by the niche-specific variations in finch beaks, but he also noticed the tortoises, as he wrote in the second voyage of the Beagle. By far the most remarkable feature in the natural history of this archipelago is that the different islands are inhabited by a different set of beings. My attention was first called to this fact by the vice governor, Mr. Lawson, declaring that the tortoises differed from the different islands, and that he could with certainty tell from which island anyone was brought. The Galapagos giant tortoise is the largest tortoise in the world. They can weigh up to 550 pounds, and the males are larger than females. Their average lifespan is 100 years, but they can live much longer, especially in captivity. They're vegetarians, um, eating mostly cactuses, grasses, and leaves. They have no natural predators, so they mostly just eat and wander around at about 0.2 miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> they also like to spend time wallowing in ponds and mud pits to keep cool. One interesting thing to note about Galapagos tortoises is that the males have a concave underside to their, to their shells so that they fit nicely over the dome back of the female when mating. <laughs> also, tortoise porn. <laughs> this slide will tell you a little bit more about the differences between the different kinds of Galapagos tortoises you can see on the different islands. On islands with plenty of vegetation and enough water, you tend to find larger tortoises with sort of a more default tortoise-style shell, which is dome-shaped. But on islands with less vegetation, where it's drier and harder to find food, tortoises have developed this unusual saddleback style, which scientists think allows them to raise their necks higher so they can get prickly pear fruits that are, would otherwise be out of reach. They also tend to be smaller and more territorial and aggressive. There's actually 15 different subspecies of Galapagos tortoises, one for almost every island, although four of those subspecies are now extinct, um, mostly or entirely, actually, because of humans. Their IUCN classification now is vulnerable. Before people got to the Galapagos Islands, there were originally about 250,000 of them, but their numbers got down to 3,000 in the mid-19th century, entirely because of exploitation by humans. 
because of ships. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, the islands were discovered in the 16th century, and shortly thereafter, pirates and privateers realized they were a great place to go to restock, especially because of Galapagos tortoises. They can be stacked in a hold, don't need any food or water for up to six months, and then you can have a fresh meal at any time. So by the mid-17th century, tortoises were being harvested by the hundreds. When the whaling industry moved from the Atlantic to the Pacific, they also realized the Galapagos were a great place to get food, so they also started harvesting tons of tortoises. They also left behind goats who ruined the native vegetation <laughs> and, and um, <laughs> competed with tortoises for food. Dogs, cats, and rats that were bought by people ate tortoise babies and their shells. <laughs> so by the time people arrived at Pinta Island in 1971, Lonesome George was the last of his subspecies living alone for who knows how many years. The last tortoise had been found on Pinta Island in 1906 and collected and killed. Um, he was discovered by some scientists doing land snail research on the island who had no idea they were seeing anything special when they came across him, but luckily happened to mention they'd seen a tortoise in passing and people decided they needed to go back and retrieve him. So an exp expedition returned to Pinta Island in 1972 to pick him up, he was found and brought back to the Charles Darwin Research Station for safekeeping and breeding. Tortoise species conservation and restoration was already in full swing at that point. Starting in 1965, the research station was the last stand for many tortoise subspecies. They managed to bring the tortoise population back from 3,000 or so in the 70s to about 19,000 now because of captive breeding and goat and rat eradication programs. So George was back at the research station. The idea was to save what could be saved of his genetic line by getting him to breed, ideally with another pinta female. George was thought to be around 60 years old at that time, right in his prime for mating. So repeated visits were made to pinta, searching for more tortoises. The remains of two different tortoises were found there, but they had died. There was no one for George. His species was declared extinct in the wild in 1996. There was even a $10,000 reward put up for finding a pinta tortoise in captivity, as there were many Galapagos tortoises in zoos and private collections but no one ever found one. George was housed with two female tortoises from the next best place, or so they thought, Isabella, an island close to Pinta, so these tortoises were thought to be close relatives. However, George avoided them and actively hid from them. I don't know if you can even see him in this slide. Um, <laughs> in general, he was super shy and timid around people and tortoises, and when he did encounter these females, he was aggressive towards them because he was a saddleback tortoise, and they tend to be territorial and mean. Um, however, in 1993, there was a change of heart when a Swiss grad student came to spend some time with George. She went into his enclosure every day, and eventually he allowed her to get close to him, close enough, in fact, for her to ascertain that all of his parts were in working order. <laughs> so if he were ever to breed, potentially it, sh it should work out. And because of her husbandry, he became a bit more calm and interested around female tortoises. But he still didn't know what to do, and nothing happened. And it's possible because he had never encountered another tortoise before, certainly had never seen mating, until 2008. Oops. Whoa. Oh, God. How did that happen? OK. In 2008, spoilers, I know, inexplicably, George started mating with both females in his enclosure. In June of 2008, the first clutch of 13 eggs was discovered, and they were taken into a lab to be put in very special conditions. Uh, they seemed to be in perfect condition, but they were discovered to be inviolable by December 2008. In July 2009, he tried again, and this time mated with both females. One of them laid a clutch of five eggs, the other one laid a clutch of six eggs. Once again, they, were, they seemed to be in perfect condition. They were taken to the lab, they were put in an incubator, but again, they were inviolable and died by the end of the year. Uh, here's what Galapagos tortoise eggs look like. Um, they were wondering if maybe the Isabella Island tortoises were the wrong spe subspecies. Um, in 2011, further genetic research proved that tortoises from Española Island were much more closely related to Pinta Island tortoises than those from Isabella, which was strange because they're much, Isabella, I'm sorry, Española Island is much farther away from Pinta Island, about as far from Pinta as you can be and still be in the Galapagos. The idea was to house George with some of these females, but as you saw, George died of old age in 2012. 
A necropsy showed that the state of his liver and heart showed that he was he had died of old age, which meant that maybe George was a lot older than they'd originally thought, which could also explain potential infertility. He was taxidermied at the American Museum of Natural History, and after his body was shown around, um, it was finally brought back to the Charles Darwin Research Station Interpretive Center in February of this year. So after George, is there any future for the Pinta Island tortoise? Well, as a long shot, scientists harvested some of his skin tissue as soon as he died. They were actually hoping to get it before he died and they've frozen it in the hopes that someday we might be able to clone George, just like Dolly the sheep who was cloned from skin cells. However, we currently don't have the technology to clone tortoises because they are raised in eggs. However, in November 2012, suddenly tortoises with Pinta Island heritage were discovered at Wolf Volcano on Isabella. They found at least 17 individuals with some juveniles implying there's possibly full-blooded Pinta adult animals wandering around Isabella Island. But how did Pinta tortoise how did pinta tortoises get to Isabella? Well, ships, of course. <laughs> we already know that hundreds of tortoises were taken aboard by ships, but there's also at least one recorded instance of tortoises being then thrown overboard. <laughs> During the War of 1812, David Porter, the captain of the USS Essex, took it upon himself to travel to the Galapagos to capture some British whaling ships. Um, while he was pursuing them, they apparently jettisoned all their tortoise cargo. As David Farragut, a midshipman from the Essex writes, wrote, the appearance of these land turtles in the water was quite singular. They floated as light as corks, stretching their long necks as high as possible for fear of drowning. So apparently two days after the pursuit, there were still tortoises floating all around the Essex, so the crew members decided to pick some up and store them to eat for later. <laughs> However, it's certainly possible that these tortoises, because they can float, ended up on the island of Isabella, and maybe that's where George's relatives ended up. So maybe there's a happy ending for the Pinta tortoise, but we are currently in an extinction crisis, and unlike previous mass extinctions, this one is caused by us. While George was still alive and people were struggling to save his species, he became a conservation icon, the last of his kind. So let us raise a glass to Lonesome George and hope that his memory inspires us to turn this trend of extinctions around and start becoming better stewards of this planet. To George.